Hey, hey, Lauren here. Today, let's talk with James Lindsay, author, academic, and outspoken critic of critical race theory. But first, I want to say thank you to today's sponsor, Noble Gold. Gold and silver have stood the test of time, and as investments, they can give some stability to times like these. Start an IRA this month with Noble Gold, and along with the first-class service that they always provide, they are also gifting a one-tenth ounce gold bullion American Eagle coin. With a Noble Gold IRA, you will have a peace of mind that you've made the right choice, as well as growing thousands of extra tax deferred dollars in your fund over the years safely and steadily. So visit noblegoldinvestments.com to learn more. Again, that is noblegoldinvestments.com to find out more and not only look into your IRA, but also support the show at the same time. So James, thank you so much for being here. I can't remember the last time we spoke. I feel like it's been too long though. Probably it was after those fake papers came out or something. Yeah. And I think you're always someone who's really interesting to follow on Twitter. You, you got some spicy takes, which maybe we'll end up talking about. But um, I wanted to talk to you today because you're kind of one of the people who first brought a lot of public attention to the idea of critical race theory and in general grievance studies being taught in academia. And now just a couple of years later, we see this in, you know, just regular public schools, high schools, even elementary schools. It's gotten to the point now. Um, I think that parents have actually spent maybe the past year doing distance classes with their kids on Zoom that they actually found out, oh, hang on, my kid is learning that like white people are privileged and racist. And so now we have this whole uh, batch of new legislation in different states that's banning CRT and some people are for it, some are against it. There's the issue of, but doesn't that violate freedom of speech? Um, what do you, where do you stand on this? Do you think banning these type of uh, courses is a good thing? Or do you think this kind of infringes on the teacher's freedoms? So it depends on a lot actually. And um, generally I'm disposed against banning uh, kind of very broad things. And when we talk about teaching, you have to talk about it at the university level and you have to talk about K through 12 slightly differently right. um, because academic freedom isn't really a thing that elementary school students have. Uh, and their <laughs> teachers are are actually mouthpieces of the state teaching state, uh, state um, organized curriculum. And so this is a completely different thing than a college professor, even in a state university, appealing to academic freedom to be able to study research, publish in some field, or then teach a course on some subject to adults. Uh, so it's a kind of a different scenario. And even there, though, where, where taxpayer money is being involved, it, it gets a little complicated. There, it, it stands the issue on its head, however, to claim that this is a violation of the free speech of teachers, because teachers in public schools, at least, are mouthpieces of the state, and the state doesn't have free speech. Right. Uh, in the United States, the First Amendment protects the, um, the freedom of individuals from having their speech compelled or limited. So they have the freedom to speak and they have the freedom not to speak if they choose not to. And it protects individuals' uh, freedom to hear or not to hear. So you can't, you should have the freedom to listen to what you want. The government sh should not be able to come in and say, you can't hear this, or you can't hear that. And at the same time, uh, it should protect your ability to not hear something if you don't want to hear something. And so when the mouthpiece is the state, you have a very different circumstance, though. You'd say, oh, well, you know, if students want to hear critical race theory, they should be able to hear it in their schools. No, they should be able to hear it somewhere. Mm -hmm. But the state making it happen in a state organized institution like a public school is the state compelling people who don't want to hear it to hear it. So the state does not actually have a freedom of speech here. This is actually a, a narrative based misinterpretation of the First Amendment that stands the issue as it actually is on its head for uh, the purposes of being able to continue to violate Civil Rights Act and even probably the Equal Protection Clause. So there's absolutely no First Amendment basis here. Now, when you get to the university, as far as academic freedom goes, should people be able to study it? Should be able people be able to teach courses about it? Yes, of course. Academic freedom mandates that those things, we should have courses about communism. We should even have probably courses that teach communist views of economics, for example. Right. We can have courses about religion. We can have courses, but when it, when it comes down to teaching it as though it is the truth, it is the fact of the matter, that's not an academic freedom issue. That's indoctrination. And so it, it is not in the same 
realm. So I think that actually, and when you look at the bills, what you see is you don't see the bills for the most part. Some states are, are experimenting with different language, but most of them are very, very careful. Most of them are modeled after the, the executive order that President Trump issued last September. And those don't ban critical race theory. They, in fact, say, and well, the, the executive order Trump issued says in Section 10 that nothing in this order shall be construed to be to mean that you can't have diversity training or that you can't uh, teach critical race theory as an academic subject. What instead it says is there are these certain divisive tenets that are actually in violation of civil rights law and equal protection law that cannot be engaged in in classroom or training or workplace training sessions using taxpayer money. And that's a very different issue. So what you have is this kind of narrative built up around, you know, the, kind of like the bookmark for people in their head is, oh, these bills ban critical race theory. And that's kind of what you see the politicians appealing to. But as a matter of fact, what the bills do is they ban racial scapegoating mm-hmm. or they ban racial discrimination, which is already illegal. They ban racial stereotyping. They ban naming the country as fundamentally evil and racist. And if that happens to exclude critical race theory, maybe critical race theory is actually the problem because it also bans the Klan. So if the Klan were to gain access and take over a school board, would you all of a sudden want them, you know, then while we're going to teach white supremacist curriculum on purpose, you know, openly KKK stuff, would you want somebody to come in and say, wait a minute, the state doesn't have freedom, the, the Klan doesn't get freedom of speech to, to teach in schools. If they want to go have a rally somewhere, as long as it's, you know, within the bounds of law, that's protected. We saw the the Supreme Court and even the ACLU in the 1970s stood up for the, the Klan's right or Nazis' rights or something like this in Skokie, uh, Illinois, where, where they were holding a rally or something of this kind. So it's certainly within people's rights to to engage in speech, but that doesn't give them rights to put it into school curricula under the First Amendment. The First Amendment doesn't say that, you know, the the state shall promote certain ideals uh, and, and ideologies and everybody has to listen to those. That's not what it says. It's, just, it's, it's the exact opposite of what it says. Yeah. And I think a lot of people who are weighing in don't necessarily understand that difference between trying to prevent someone from saying something and being compelled to actually fund teachers indoctrinating perhaps even your kids or even if it's not your kids you know your your tax dollars may still be going there whether you want it or not which is interesting and i mean speaking of the school systems we know that the uh, the work that you helen pluckrose and uh, dr bogosian focused on it wasn't just racial grievance studies it was you know you talked about feminism you did a feminist rewriting of mein kampf as well um what we see also in these schools is i mean the whole realm of intersectionality infringing on the curriculum them, right so it's not just critical race theory you also have like intersectional feminism and uh, you know like this sex positive type of sex ed ta- being taught to increasingly young children and most recently i think we saw that uh, the school that baron trump used to go to parents were outraged because they had a, a lesson about pornography and we also see children being taught very young about things like masturbation and i i very firmly believe that Kids are going to have questions about their bodies. Uh, It's nothing to be ashamed of. We shouldn't try to stifle that conversation and act as if it's unhealthy. But I think there's a difference between that and also saying, hey, kids, let's learn about gangbang pornography. Uh, What do you think about that? Okay, so I agree with you. Um, Just to be very clear, I completely agree with you about that. Um, There are kind of two levels of things that have to be talked about where you are right that it's not just race theory. We're seeing the intrusion of of ideas that were born in and and supported by queer theory as well. And there are kind of two levels here that we have to address within the kind of importation of queer theory, uh, which is where you're seeing the so-called sex positive stuff. And one is that there's this grotesque blurring of the boundaries of what is and is not appropriate. It's actually, it's almost the point where the people that that push these things have lost their sense of propriety in terms of, in fact, they don't believe in boundaries. They think that boundaries are oppressive. And so um, on the lighter of the two levels of this, what you have is, well, you know, that you have schools and teachers within the schools deciding that they are qualified and the appropriate vessels to engage in these conversations or these lessons with children in um, unregulated spaces. You say, well, no, the school is regulated, but it's not the kind of regulated space where you have kind of one-on-one and you can address somebody's concerns or something personal comes up. Um, So it's, it's an unregulated space. And you see this same kind of blurring where the kind of focus on the therapeutic mindset is so prominent within the, the, the woke ideology under, overall, but also within the schools. And so what you see, for example, is, you know, the 
constant focus on trauma and harm. And they're bringing up all these very psychologically therapeutic concepts. And then they're doing this. Your teacher is not probably a licensed psychologist and they're not doing it in a therapeutic setting in a therapeutic context with all of the safeguards and protections. They're not getting to know each one. You can't talk to a group of 30 or whatever kids or 20 kids at one time and know all of their various personal issues and possible triggers or whatever it are, whatever issues are going on, you can't possibly know all of that and engage in that in a classroom environment. So it's a completely inappropriate space, whether we're talking about this kind of therapeutic mindset, which then bleeds into this. Now it's going to be like sex therapy mindset. We're going to give, and it's just absolutely inappropriate by the people giving it to the context of the the people in terms of their ages. And in the, the space in which it's being done, the environment, it's all been blurred out like you know, having a child talking to their therapist or something like that, if that were something that were happening is one thing, having a child talk to their parents is one thing, but then you have a unqualified professional in a unregulated space covering things that are age inappropriate with all of the boundaries between blurred. And this is a very consistent theme in queer theory. And the darker aspect of that, I've been seeing a number of papers. I'm starting to read more deeply into queer theory now. I feel like the fight against critical race theory is getting successful. And I have not turned enough of my attention to queer theory. I'm familiar with it, but I haven't read it to the same level of depth. And reading queer theory, I keep running into the same concept. And I tweeted my spicy takes last year about this at one point is that there is a deliberate attempt to deconstruct the idea of childhood innocence mm. within queer theory. They see the innocence of children as an oppressive construct, that it is something that adults mostly in you know kind of post-Victorian, repressive Christian Protestant environments have foisted upon children and it causes repression of sexual, you know, whatever the sexuality of a child even means, causes repression of that, and causes all these harms and traumas and blah, blah, blah. And so they're, they have this whole idea that we need to break down the idea that children or childhood should be innocent at all because the innocence of children is a power dynamic. Yeah, it's disgusting. Yeah, and so like again, you see this like literally pathological failure to understand appropriate boundaries like age or developmentally appropriate boundaries, space appropriate boundaries, environment appropriate boundaries, professional qualification, appropriate boundaries. And you see this utter attempt when this is what queer theory is all about. Queer is supposed to be, it is the identity without an essence. So it's to take all boundaries and dissolve. That's how they describe themselves, by the way. They, they take all boundaries and dissolve all of them. And it becomes this kind of free for all where now we're having extremely age inappropriate, environment inappropriate lessons being taught to children about sex and even psychological therapeutic ideas in by people who aren't qualified to do so in environments that are absolutely inappropriate to, to the circumstance and the theory justifies all this because it thinks it's great um and it thinks it's as as michelle foucault would have put it expanding the potentialities of being for these poor kids who are actually being abused that's without even mentioning just to touch it tangentially that this creates a grotesque opportunity for for um for groomers and and other predators to step in, you know, like the scandals in the Catholic church precede it in, in a rather uh, shocking way. But this is like 10 times the opening for that kind of scandal because it's so explicit and it's so uh, openly demanded and there are no boundaries. There's no attempt to, to make it, you know, kind of hidden. And we just saw that with, you know, the one guy in the Denver school board that we hit it, assaulted 62 or something like this. Um, mostly uh, undocumented immigrant children in the school system, just horrific. Right. And I think um, this has kind of started to become more of a popular topic because I know there was this photo of this young girl at a pride parade and it's actually not a new photo. I think it was taken around two years ago, uh, but it's her and she's kind of like almost, it looks like she's feeding these two grown men who are playing dogs. Like they have dog things on there in chains and stuff like that and and it's it's funny because uh, she won head who is a uh, leftist she mentioned that she used to in maybe 2016 say that this idea that lgbt activists are trying to sexualize uh, pride in general around children that's just right-wing fear-mongering but i think we see now um you know a lot of even gay or trans people themselves say i know blair writes Blair White says that after she went to a pride parade, she felt like she needed to go to church because it's just this breaking down of boundaries. And I think, you know, if it comes to something like a kink, boundaries are okay. But you have a concerning amount of people who are arguing that kink is not 
not child friendly, that they're, it's perfectly acceptable. And I almost feel like um, they can understand the fact that something can be okay for an adult and not okay for a child or can be okay in private and not okay in public. And I think that's that's kind of what's contributing to this almost exhibitionism that we see yeah. for so much of this activism now. Yeah. And there's kind of, again, two things very relevant to point out about that. And one of those things is that not only does queer theory seek to break down all boundaries to get without an essence, it is an identity without an essence. And so it's then attaching this to identity. So your fetishist who dresses like a dog or wears leather or whatever, walk around on a leash or whatever they do, that's not going to just be considered something somebody does. The, the boundary between being and doing is heavily blurred. So that what you do is who you are. That's who you genuinely are inside. And so now it's an identity. And so the justification in queer theory for it's, they would, they would say what they're doing is actually helping children who might be deep inside as their true kind of neoplatonistic, perfect form of an identity deep inside themselves, their true self as a fetishist. They're helping them see an example of that and reach into identify and to realize that they are leather, leather identifying or, you know, furry identifying or whatever it is. And that's, again, a complete misunderstanding of what's going on. And it's a, it's, it's a fairly grotesque justification for the behavior, like you said, that, that transgresses these boundaries or dissolves these boundaries in a way that is not good on its face. And as I, as I was saying, opens the door for, for all kinds of abuse. And then the second thing is that we, you do have to understand with a discipline like queer theory, but it's kind of true of all of these critical disciplines there, this, you know, we, is the slipper is the slope slippery. That's what we were kind of talking about with the, in 2018, this is just right, right, right wing propaganda, et cetera, is the slope slippery. Well, the truth is when you have a deconstructive or a critical approach, and I need to write and speak on this more soon, that the slope is always slippery. As a matter of fact, it's not even slippery. It's like you got some dude in leather polishing that thing with Teflon. <laughs> I've it heard is, people call it, it's not a slippery slope, it's a cliff. It's just a sheer drop it is. cliff. But there's a reason. And the reason is very simple. It's that any amount of decon... Any, so if you're you have you have like an edifice and you're trying to deconstruct it, any amount that you leave standing is some of the status quo that's still there. So you're still problematic. So you see this very particularly with the transition from gender critical feminism into queer theory, which is that's where queer theory came from. So the gender critical feminists were like gender is a social construct, not is partly not as kind of not has elements of social construction, which is all true is a social construct is 100% a social construct. So they've but then they said that biological sex is not to be touched. That's biological, that's real. That's and that what that does is it leaves half of the game on the table and the queer theorists come along and say you didn't deconstruct everything, you're actually conservatives. <laughs> so now they're starting with now. biological sex as we've seen. And then they right, so the sl the slope will naturally have to be slippery because anything that doesn't get taken apart, anything that doesn't take that next slippery slope step is leaving some of the the oppressive status quo on the table. So it has to be the case. So with leftism, the slope is always slippery by definition. And that's a very important concept for people to realize. It's not oh we're going to have this much and then it stops here with leftism, which is not necessarily to say progressives, it's not definitely not to say liberals, but with leftists, the slope is by definition, always as slippery as possible. And to the degree that progressives, which is going to be kind of a lot, and liberals end up supporting this, they're, they're over there helping polish up the slide as well, uh, to make sure it stays slick, um, not realizing always what they're doing. And I think there, the, you know, there's a level of nuance there to start separating between these deconstruction type leftists versus even, you know, good natured progressives who are their kind of useful idiots and liberals who don't have any enough common sense to realize that something has to be, somebody has to be an adult in the room sooner or later. Uh, but either way, the slope is always going to be slippery. And we see that in action with this stuff. Definitely. And I think, you know, looking back to videos I was making maybe five years ago, I've been doing this a while. Um, I remember I was talking about the humanities and the arts and how they were infested with these type of people. And I had all of these STEM people saying, ha ha, that's why you should stick to the hard sciences. Well, guess what? Now we have, I mean, you know, the, the whole two plus two equals four thing. It's infecting math. It's definitely infecting biology and medicine. And, you know, we saw that at 
at first people were saying, well, you know, there's a difference between gender and biological sex. Now they're even questioning biological sex. What do you think is going to be the next frontier um, that they try to deconstruct and that they try to keep pushing? Because it's kind of interesting to see how the trends have been. And even just, uh, I mean, a few years ago, things that I would have considered sacred and completely indisputable, indisputable, they're now being questioned. What do you see next? I mean, the push in medicine is going to be kind of overwhelming. Uh, there are a lot of reasons for that, some of which are cynical, like that it's probably the largest single industry in the economy. So there's a ton of money to grift out of it. But um, medicine, the push in medicine is is well developed and is going to go, it will go to the point where we will actually see probably a lot of tragedy that was all avoidable because people are not going to step up and say, no, we're going to have medical lysenkoism. As far as the next frontier, it's uh, what frontier is left. If they're going, if you're talking about academic True. disciplines, if it's in, if it's uh, engineering maybe is kind of the, the last one because it's like so results oriented, but if it's in math and it's in physics and it is, and it's making its way into those subjects, not just into the, the departments, the front that we're out of frontiers. Um, but the, it's important to understand how this operates in these hard sciences, because it's easy to see how it works in the humanities, even the social sciences, because the defenses are relatively low, things are a bit squishy. It's a lot of it is rhetoric and argument is what it comes down to. But how in the world did it get into math? Right. And the answer is that they infect the departments. I, I put this out about a year ago or a little, it's actually Christmas of 2019 that I put it out. And I was trying to explain to people that they try to turn every subject into the sociology of that subject. Right. And then they go after the sociology, which is in their social science realm, in the applicative sense of, say, the academic department or the conference space or the so called community. You know, now we have to talk about the problems in the physics community or the math community. That means everybody who's a practicing mathematician or even tangential to that is going to be math joke is going to be kind of brought into that, like have that thumb put on their scale. And then they're going to eventually get enough people and enough power within the departments and the discipline as a sociological object to start digging more deeply and say, well, maybe the problems in the departments actually come from the subject itself. And then they start to change the subject. And then they declare that the subject has to be replaced by the critical study of whatever and basically fill, fill their docket with all of their grift. And so this is how this is happening. But as far as frontiers left, there, what's, what is there? The military? Whoops, too late. Mm -hmm. I mean, CIA what's left? Even? Yeah, CIA. Military, I'm not supposed to say NSA. I'm not supposed to know that one. <laughs> NSA, um, engineering, if you're talking about academic disciplines, but like you what next frontier? The next frontier is actually just to start spending down every one of these things. And since they've now conquered all of these things, the next frontier is to start purging anything that still has dissidents if they have the power to purge them. And that's where you know, you say diversity, equity, and inclusion, that's, or belonging, that's where inclusion and belonging come in. Those are your justifications for purges. Yeah, scary stuff. Um, thank you, as always, for coming on, sharing your insights. If people want to follow you, keep up with what you're doing, where's the best place to do that? And like I mentioned before, Twitter, you're an awesome follow, but yeah, thank you. Where? Yeah, I'm at Conceptual James on Twitter and most of the other social media platforms, though I'm really only genuinely active on Twitter. Um, the rest of them, we just kind of echo what I do on Twitter onto the other social media, but whatever you like i'm usually at conceptual james i'm on most of the big platforms um my company is new discourses it's at newdiscourses.com. you can see my podcast all of the articles that i write videos that i make etc there but then you can also um follow it on social media at new discourses same deal it's at most of the major platforms at new discourses so easy to find and you can keep up with me and the work that i'm putting out and publishing etc. at those two locations. Awesome. Well, again, thank you. And I'm glad you're out there doing this work. I wish that it wasn't necessary, but as long as it is, it's, it's nice to know that you're on the case. Thank you so much for your time.